father took his young son to worship. The son had never been there before. And the, his son is about eight or nine years old. And he said, Dad, you tell me now what everything means. I've never been here before. And, and you tell me what, what's going on, what things mean. And so when the preacher uh, arose to begin his sermon, he reached in his pocket and pulled out something and fiddled here around his tie and checked the box. He, and he said, well, son, I mean, dad, what, what does that mean? That means that he's just hooked up now where uh, everybody can hear what he says. Okay. And then a little later, the preacher reaches in his pocket and gets out a tuning fork. And he hits it on his hand and his son said, Daddy, what does that mean? Well, that means that he's just getting his pitch. And then he, <clears throat> he reaches in his pocket and, and brings out his pocket watch and puts it on the, on the lectern. The son said, Daddy, what does that mean? He said, not a thing in the world. <laughs> so, brethren, we ought to thank God that we live in a land where we can assemble to honor and praise our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus without fear that the government will interfere and hinder us from worshiping God. One time I was in India, no Burma. Well, I was in India several times, but I was in Burma and we had to meet secretly to study the Bible and to pray to God because the government didn't want us to do that. So I want you to think now how important it is that we're here today in the name of the Lord to honor Him and praise Him for His mercy, for His grace, and for the revelation of His will. This may be, I guess every preacher can say this, but this may be the last sermon I preach. Maybe not, but it may be because of health issues. Uh, 73 years ago this December, I preached my first sermon. That was, I was two years old. <laughs> It was in Lewis Schoolhouse, just south of Ball Knob, Arkansas, December 1945. Since that time, by the grace of God, I've had the honor and privilege of preaching the unsearchable reaches of Christ on four, four continents. And I won't get started telling you some experiences I've had. But I say this as I reflected upon some of the things that have occurred these 73 years. If this is my last sermon, <clears throat> I ask myself, what should I preach? What should I say that is of importance? that has to do with our salvation, that would give hope, comfort to those who hear the word. And as I reflected upon the subject I wanted to talk about, I, I thought, you know, I want to preach the truth, the word of God. I don't care one whit about what I think and what I believe. I wish everybody on earth would be saved. So does God. 
But I want you to know what the word is. And for the next few minutes, give ear to what the word says. Was read Ephesians 3. A few verses were read in your hearing. Paul in, is writing to Christians at Ephesus where he spent considerable time preaching the gospel, converting people to the Lord. Years ago, I was in Ephesus. Not when Paul was there, but sometime after. So I see the old city of Ephesus and that theater that seats 30,000 people where Paul preached. Paul writes in AD 62 or 63 this letter and remember this now it's AD 62 AD 63 about 2,000 years ago and he has something to say to these Ephesians because they have been taught incorrectly. And Paul said that by revelation in Ephesians 3 and verse 3, I want you to know about the mystery that I'm going to deliver to you by revelation. God's going to declare unto me a message about this mystery that for ages hath been hid in God. You want to know what that mystery is? In Ephesians 3, Paul said, in beginning in verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says in these verses that those in higher places, in higher realms, the archangels and other heavenly beings see the complex wisdom of God's plan being worked out through the church according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in his son Jesus. That eternal purpose Paul was bringing to their attention. He no doubt reminded them that God in the beginning created man in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Man has within him an eternal spirit given to him by God and will return to God when we die. And when God gave Adam and Eve this not only physical life but spiritual life, he gave them a beautiful place in which to live. He gave Adam a help me. He provided the food and every blessing that man would ever need. But he created man with the ability to choose, to make decisions. It wasn't long until Adam and Eve succumbed to temptations that led them away from God. They sinned. And God in Genesis 3.15 said, there's something that you need to know. Man has created my likeness, in my, in my own image. But man has deserted me. Man has turned away. But I'm going to see that man has help. And he tells in this chapter 3, verse 15, that old Satan's head will be bruised. And then he begins to unfold man's life on the earth and how man became so wicked that God decided to destroy wicked man by sending a flood. There were eight people who were saved from that flood. Eight. 
And it is said that there were millions of people living on earth at that time. Wicked people. But God in His justice declared that He was going to remove them from the world. And He did. And out of, of Noah came three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then God raised up a man from the Ur of the Chaldees called Abraham. And in Genesis 12, 3, God promised Abraham that if his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. They didn't understand what that really meant. But God said, I'm going to, through the, the lineage of Shem, bring into the world someone that can bring about the redemption of mankind. And so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, also revealed this message. And so God, in time, brought the Israelites out of captivity across the Red Sea into the wilderness. God gave man then a law. Not all men, but He gave it to the seed of Abraham. And promised Abraham that he would give them a country, a country named Canaan. God gave these people a law. The law that was to last until the seed should come. Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. So God gave a law not to Ham and Japheth, but he gave it to the Israelites. Namely, to Judah. And Jesus then, in, in the fullness of time, came into the world, born of woman, born of the law, that he might redeem them under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, said Paul. When Jesus came to the world, in fulfillment of over 300 passages in the Old Testament that, that referred to this man, Jesus. So Jesus came to born of, of Mary in Bethlehem, born of a virgin. He was God in the flesh. God incarnate, Matthew says in chapter 1. Why did God send Jesus? Because he loved the world. He didn't abandon man to send him to perdition without man having access to God's redemptive plan. So when Jesus came to the world, he wanted the world to know who he was by what he said and what he did and, and in fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures, he said, I'm the son of God. But Jesus came to the Jews. The Jews uh, believed they were and they were special people of God because through, through Shem and uh, the Israelites, God brought to the world the Savior of the world. But that's not the mystery that Paul is talking about. There's something else that God did. But Jesus said uh, in his ministry now, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. That's one thing he was going to do to enable them to have life. And then he said, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to build something else. I'm going to build the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing's going to deter me from establishing the church. That was about A.D. 31 or A.D. 32. Jesus, before he died, said to his disciples, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, Matthew records, go teach all nations. So Jesus has in his mind preaching to all the world. The Jews believed that he was talking about preach to all the Jews in the world. That's not what God had in mind. And so on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came to reveal the message of God to the apostles, they preached Jesus and Him crucified. That day 3,000 people submitted their will to God and God then added them to his church. When was that? A.D. 33. But the, the Gentiles yet 
have not heard the message. It took a miracle to convince Peter that he ought to preach to the Gentiles. They were without God and without hope in the world, Paul said. And so God wanted this message to go to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. The Jews didn't believe that. And so much or many passages in the New Testament are revealed to try to convince the Jewish Christians that God's message is not only for them, but for the descendants of Ham and Japheth, for all the world. In Hebrews 2 verse 9, Paul said Christ tasted of death for every man, not just for the rich or the poor or just for the white or just for the black, for every man. The Jews didn't understand that. And so Paul now writes to the Christians at Ephesus where he had spent at least six months teaching the word to them. And so he says to them in this third chapter, by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before, in few words whereby you can understand. Paul said, I have not something that's incomprehensible, but something that has not been revealed. I'm going to bring this mystery to you. Now Paul then, as he writes later on in the passage I read you, said that those in higher places, the angels, the archangels, those uh, in heavenly places would see the wisdom of God his plan being worked out through the church according to God's eternal purpose God's purpose in the very beginning was to save humanity not just the Jewish people and so this became a mystery you don't see much in the Old Testament about God's plan to save the Gentiles it has to do with the Jews for the most part. And so Paul wants people to know and that the heavenly beings see in the church this eternal plan of God. Paul tells what this mystery is. Listen to it. In Hebrews chapter 3, Paul said, I'm going to tell you, when you read this, you can understand in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it has now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to wit. Now he's going to tell you what this mystery is that was hidden for years. God didn't have much to say about it. To wit, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Now that was a shocking revelation to the Jews. He said, now, the Gentiles are to be fellow heirs. That is, they can inherit that which is immortal, that which is eternal, that which fades not away, Peter says in chapter 1. And so the Gentiles are to be fellow heirs. That is, with you Jews. They're going to inherit. And then he says, fellow members of the body. Well, they're going to be able to be a part of the body. To whom does the body belong? In Ephesians 4 verse 12, Paul says, the body of Christ, the body belongs to Christ. It's his body. And now he says, the Gentiles along with the Jews can be fellow members of the body. And you say, well, Norman, what's he talking about? You want me to tell you? In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, Paul said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and fill up unto my part, which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The body of Jesus is also identified as the, as the church. When Jesus said, I'll build my church, he's saying, I'm going to build my body. Paul said in Ephesians 4 verse 4, there is one body. Somebody, I asked that question the one time, 
to somebody to identify one. He said half of two. And that's what it is. <laughs> but now, Paul said in Ephesians 3, these Gentiles not only can be fellow heirs, they can inherit along with the Jews, but they are members, fellow members of the church that Jesus said, I will build. The church over which Jesus, Paul said, rules as head. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, God made him, talking about Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Jesus not only built the church, but he's the head of it. And in Acts 20, 28, Paul said, he purchased the church with his own blood. He's not talking about some denomination. He's talking about the church. He's talking about what happened in the first century. Jesus died that he might bring into existence a people identified as the called out people. That's what the church means. Now, not only then are the Gentiles to be fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, that is, they have uh, access to every blessing that's found in the body of Christ, but he said also fellow partakers of the promise in Christ. Well, what's the promise of Christ? 1 John 2, verse 25, John said, this is the promise which he has promised us, even life eternal. So now you have life, not just physical life here on earth for a few years, but you have life forever. That's the mystery that was hidden for ages. And uh, Paul said now, even the heavenly beings can see through the church, the wisdom of God. Paul is not talking about organizations that began this side of the first century. The Roman church started in the early part of the sixth century. During the Reformation, you had the, the inauguration of a number of, of religious denominations. Paul's not talking about that. There's something different. He's talking about the church. Why? The church, the body of Christ. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul said, the house of God, that's the family of God, is the church. So when you're talking about the church, you're talking about the family of God. You're talking about the body of Christ. Somebody said, preacher, the church doesn't save you. That's correct. The church is the saved of God. Christ is the Savior. But the church is made up of those people who are saved from sin by the blood of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, those 3,000 people who heard the message that Peter preached, believed Jesus to be the Son of God, repented, and were immersed, they were saved. And in Acts 2, 47, God added those people to the church. In God's church, you don't join. When you are redeemed from sin, God then puts you in His spiritual family, His body, His church. That's New Testament Christianity. God according to Ephesians 2 verses 14 through 16 says that we're reconciled to God in the one body. You know, we're at enmity with God when we sin. And if we die in sin, Jesus said, where I am there, you cannot come. So man's sin problem must be dealt with. And it's through the blood of Jesus our sins are forgiven. But we're baptized into the death of Jesus. I wonder why Paul made that statement in Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. And John chapter 19, in his death, Jesus shed his blood. He was dead, and they pierced his side with a spear, forthwith came both blood and water. In his death, he shed his blood. That's why Paul said, don't you know, that all we who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. That's where we receive the benefits of the death of Jesus. And so throughout the first century, as these 
apostles of Jesus went out to preach the gospel to the world under the direction of the Holy Spirit. They produced the evidence for the deity of Jesus, establishing by not only the Old Testament scriptures, but by his miraculous birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, that he's the Son of God. And when they said, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Jesus, what did you do with those people? I put them in my church. I put them in my family. So when you see the sign, the church of Christ, if we understand the scriptures, that means we're talking about the body of Jesus, the family of God that began in A.D. 33. That's the church I want to be a part of. When you begin to enter this church building, you see on the right side of the door some writing. It's a stone. And inscribed in that stone, in that stone by the desire of the elders of this church, Church of Christ. The origin is in Jerusalem, A.D. 33. We want to be not like the early church we want to be the same church the same spiritual body the same family the same spiritual kingdom as existed in the first century that's the message of the gospel i know that sometimes preachers are not very wise in what they say but i want you to know in all kindness if you want to go to heaven, you must be a part of the body of Jesus. You say, preacher, how do you know? Well, I've already given you sufficient scriptures. You're reconciled to God in the body, Paul said in Ephesians 2, 14 through 60. But in Ephesians 5, verse 23, Paul said, for as Christ is the head of the church, Jesus is the savior of the body. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus saves the body. That's why we need to rejoice when we're a part of the body, the church of our Lord. Because when the trumpet sounds, the dead are raised, the redeemed of the ages. God's church will hear the call. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we be with him forever. That's New Testament teaching. That's not my will. That's what the Bible says. I'm glad you're here. If I preach, if I don't preach another sermon, you can't say you didn't know because in love I have related to you what the Bible has to say. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus says, come and I will give you rest. All you that labor, he says, I'll give you rest. He came to save the world. But the world is already condemned as we read in John 3, 18. But if you want to go to heaven, you must be a part of the family of God. You must be a part of the church that Jesus said, I will build the church for which he died. That's New Testament teaching. We're going to sing. If you want to be a part of the body of Christ, the Lord can put you in his church, his family. You can live for him the rest of your days on this earth. And you can die in hope with a smile on your face. Through these 73 years, I've had many experiences, as you can realize. One day, my phone rang when I was preaching in Jasper, Texas. 
And this lady said, Brother Starling, come quick, come quick, my husband's dying. Now I'm about 22 years or 23 years old. I hadn't been f facing many people dying, but I rushed up to her house. She was standing on the porch. She beckoned to me, come on. And she opened the door. He says, she said, he's in there in that bedroom. So I walk in, now he's a member of the body of Christ. He's been a part of the church for years, but he had abandoned God. And when I walked in, I can see him today, raising his hands toward heaven and saying, Brother Sean, don't let me die. I said, sir, I can't keep you from dying. I can pray for you, but I can't keep you from dying. And a few, just a few weeks later, I went to the hospital to visit Brother B. Hannon, who was dying. He was a deacon in the church. When I walked in, I knocked on the door and opened it gradually. When he saw me, he said, come in, Brother Starling, come in. I'm 23 years old. And he said, Brother Starling, they tell me I'm not gonna live but just a short time, but said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to see my maker. My, what a difference it was. When you come to die, you would best be a part of the family of God. You must, must be a part of the church, the body that belongs to Jesus. And to do that, to be a part of the body, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's what God says. If you want to be a part of the body, and you're not already a part of the body, but if you want to be a part of the body that Jesus said, I'm going to save, why don't you this day make that decision that you're going to obey the Lord? We're going to sing. Will you stand right now as the song director leaves us in the song?